you like to introduce yourself? Welcome. Oh, are you forgetting about me? Have a good view. You're going to have a good night. I'd like to turn this over tonight to Hollis Winston. Hollis is the chair of the African American Caucus, and he is an amazing person. I like him. I think everybody will after tonight. Um, Hollis has an MBA from Carlson School of Management. He works for Express Script, but he always worked for Boston Scientific. So, with no, no further ado, Hollis. Thank you, Cheryl. So I'd like to say thank you to all of um, the candidates for coming out, also to Sterling. Um, I'd love us all to show how progressive do business, right? So we can have people in the room that we disagree with and still have a reasonable conversation. So thank you so much, Sterling, for showing up. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the, to the candidates pretty quickly, but I just want to go over how it's going to work. And then I also want to thank the folks who, who helped set all of this up, because without, without the volunteers, right, um, CD3 and the different Senate districts, who take time to make this happen, this event just, just, just doesn't happen, right? And so they're a critical part to the democracy and, and this whole process that we're going through. So I'd like to start with Cheryl, um, who made my day by saying she likes me. So, um, <laughs> great, thank you, thank you so much. Um, and then uh, Marge Hoppe, who, who isn't here, also helped to make this event happen. Um, John Wexler, who's been kind of running around just making sure everything happens. Um, and it's happening, John. Um, and then um, um, Basil um, Ajuo, who's uh, been helping out. So there you are, um, helping out. Um, Nancy Schumacher, um, Malia Derrick, Josine Durant, and uh, Kyle um, Tun. Right, I have it right. So I just want everyone to kind of give them a round of applause before we start calling the candidates. <laughs> because they take the time to make this happen. Um, and then next, we have a few electeds in the room, and if I miss, if I miss anybody, uh, please forgive me. But first, I wanna uh, send a shout out to Senator uh, John Hoffman, uh, as Senate District 36. Um, and then Mike Nelson of uh, Senate District 36. I saw you hiding back there, Mike. I need you to stand up. So uh, the way this is going to work is that uh, we're going to give it to the to the main event pretty soon. But everyone's going to get about two minutes. Um, and just just a refresher, we have um, Josine, one of our volunteers, is going to hand out hand uh, hold up a piece of papers. One saying one minute, another saying um, that one saying thirty actually. So we want that. Is there a minute thirty one? Yeah, thirty one. Yeah, one minute. Oh, minute thirty. And then two or whatever. Yeah, stop. Whatever. The system works. We got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So uh, we're creative. We're progressive. Figure this out. So, um, so we're gonna have that for everybody. But we're gonna give um, give you guys our most questions. We're gonna give you two minutes. Uh, if there's a little bit of extra time, or if there's something that we think need, needs clarification, or if you're just really passionate or into it, I may direct for a little bit more time than probably thirty seconds um, or a minute. So, um, I think that's pretty much what I covered, but we're going to start with the opening statement, then we're going to jump into the questions, um, and then after that you'll get a um, two-minute closing statement. So, um, just so everyone knows, that they're going to do a much better job introducing themselves um, than I am, but we have Alicia Donahue, uh, Dean Phillips, Adam Jennings, Jim Hawkin, am I, am I killing it? Am I? All right, great. And then Brian, uh, Brian Santa Maria, right? Yep. I can't do the accent, but great. Um, so, without any further, um, I'll go ahead and hand it off to Alicia. And, um, you know, we can just go back and forth down the line. But we'll have you start off for two minutes and then you can start the timing. Yeah. Great, great. So, again, yeah, opening, opening statement, just go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody. Hi everybody, thank you so much for coming tonight. My name is Alicia Donahue, and I'm a clinical social worker, community activist, and I was one of the lead organizers and co-founders of the Women's March here in Minnesota. And now I'm running for Congress because our community needs somebody who will listen to everyone in the district, who will stand up for all of our values, and who will fight for all of our futures. 
I currently work for the state of Minnesota as a regional ombudsman, which requires me to stand up for my clients' rights and ensure that their voices are heard every single day. This requires me to integrate with big players such as the Department of Human Services, the Department of Health, and the Department of Education. Every day I go sit at the table with them, literally or figuratively, um, and challenge them on very serious issues and regulations that impact my clients' lives. And often we're not in agreement. And so we have to find a way to work together and create a relationship based on integrity that will allow me to challenge them and fight for my clients' rights one day and work with them in partnership the next. This is an important skill set for our next congressperson to have because we don't have that in Washington right now. So I'm excited that you're all here today. Um, I'm energized by all of you and I look forward to answering your questions. Good evening, everybody. I'm Dean Phillips, and I would love to be your next congressman. I welcome the Democrats in the room, most of you probably, Republicans, Independents, Libertarians, uh, our trackers, uh, Nate and Sterling. Uh, I love you all. I'm glad you would take the time out of your nights uh, to spend with us uh, and have a conversation. Uh, I am doing this uh, not out of fear uh, or anger, uh, rather out of optimism uh, and possibility uh, and responsibility. Uh, when I was a little boy, when I was six months old, my birth father, Artie Pfeffer, was killed in the Vietnam War. Uh, he had uh, entered the ROTC to pay for college here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, my mother was widowed at 24. We moved in with my great-grandparents, uh, and so my life began. Uh, and in the stroke of extraordinary good fortune, a couple years later, my mother remarried Eddie Phillips, uh, and with that into an extraordinary family uh, of achievement and celebrity and philanthropy uh, and great values. Uh, but I come to this recognizing that extremely fine line between advantage and disadvantage, uh, and believe it is incumbent upon those who have been the beneficiaries of good, good fortune uh, to extend opportunities to as many human beings as humanly possible. Uh, I've endeavored during my business career and as a job creator to provide opportunities to people uh, in my philanthropic life to afford opportunities, uh, and I want to complement that now with good public policy. Uh, I am disturbed and find distasteful the tone in Washington, D.C. I want to be a voice of reason uh, and possibility. And I would love your support. I'm grateful to you all uh, and so happy to be here tonight. Excuse me. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Adam Jennings, and I want to be your next congressman as well. Um, thank you all for coming this evening. And uh, thank you, CD3, for hosting this event. Um, uh, Cheryl, Marge, Kay, John, everyone, all the officers, this is so important because it gives the public the opportunity to take a look at the candidates and differentiate between our own stances. I'd also like to thank the other candidates. Um, frankly, go having these conversations, uh, it makes us better. Um, now, history has shown us that Democrats don't win in the third district by pandering to Republicans. Democrats win in this district by standing for core democratic principles and values. Now here are three core democratic principles that we can all agree on. One, public education is paramount. I am the product of public education. My wife, she's a pediatrician. She takes care of so many families in the community and she is the product of public education. We want the best for our children and that's why we're gonna send them to public schools in our community. We stand behind teachers as Democrats because teachers are the bedrock of public education. Now, two, single-payer universal health care. Anything less is pandering to profiteers at the expense of millions of Americans. And three, Democrats are the party of union labor. Let me say that again. Democrats are the party of union labor. I stand with Democrats because stand, Democrats stand for working families. Now I've held my union card. I have my MBA in finance. I've managed billions of dollars in assets. I've won an election. I've served in the military. I'm a father, a husband, a deacon of my church, and a small business owner. Being a Democrat for me, it's not just a theory, it's a way of life. It's, it's, it's a way of life for so many of us in this room this evening, and thank you. Thank you for being here this evening. I look forward to a spirited discussion.
I'm Jim Haugen, and I wanted to get a good seat in front. <laughs> I was born and raised in a small town in a rural area, Princeton, Minnesota. I grew up in a Republican house. My family was middle class. My mom had severe mental illness. We did not have health care insurance. Medical bills at times were a serious financial struggle. It was a big struggle for the family to hang on to middle class. I had very good fortune to go to a public school with talented, passionate teachers. I got a great education, even more good fortune. I had a part-time job in a small business that taught me to work hard, to have a good work ethic, and to love to work. That helped me earn money to go to the University of Minnesota. My consulting career began working with small businesses in small towns in rural areas across the US. I went on to work with large global companies, helping them get major projects done so they can use new technology and software to improve the way they do things and solve problems. I led the project teams of consultants and key people from the company. We built the solutions that drove their change and improved the way they did things. Why am I doing this? For the last three decades, big waves of change have swept through the economy. Those changes have come from technology, innovation, business, politics, changes in values. Many people ride those waves and are doing well. Many people have been left behind. They lost their job, their pay is low, they lost their wealth. They had no, they have no say in those changes. So let's get involved, work together on changes that build new solutions for financial security and functional government. Uh, thanks everybody for coming out. Um, I'm not the type of candidate that you guys have voted for before, which is a good thing, uh, because as you all know in this district, the candidates you voted for before haven't won. I'm, I'm Brian Santa Maria. I'm a dad, I'm a comedian, I'm a creative director, I'm a satirist, um, I'm a Democrat. And I'm a Democrat because I believe in progress. And I think we don't make progress by running away from progressivism. Um, so I'm a proud progressive, and when I was talking about it this weekend at a different event, I was introducing a friend of mine, and he's a performer, and I was talking about how I knew him, and I knew him because we both auditioned together years ago in New York. And when you auditioned, I was saying that you go into a new room, and you stand in front of a whole bunch of people, sometimes one person, sometimes one person in the back who's just pretending to look at your resume, the rooms aren't always warm, warm. but you stand there and you try and tell them to hire you, right? And I was saying how similar that is to now, how similar is to campaigning, to going into rooms, to meeting everybody, to shaking their hands, and asking them to please hire me. Um, but then that, that got me wondering, what's the similarity here? What's the commonality? And I realized I did them both for the same reasons. I was an auditioner. I was, I'm now a politician for the same reason. Because I believe in something. Because I'm passionate. Because I want to make something beautiful. I want to make something wonderful. And I know from the arts that to do that, you need that room full of people. You need the audience, you need the people watching the stage and the people on the stage to be sharing that experience. Without us all doing the same thing, without us all working hard, we don't make family leave, we don't make family health care, we don't make a family income. So right here, I'm excited to answer these questions. I'm excited that everybody's up here answering them with me. I'm ready for the discourse. Um, I believe in something. Let's do something. Okay, uh, well thanks. It looks like we have a lot of passion in the room, which is great. I am going to point out one thing. Let's try to stay under two minutes. I have an email from someone and it says, that's a hard stop. Score one out. Oh, it's a hard stop? Yeah, it's a hard stop. Okay, it's a hard stop. So, I'll write that down. Right. Um, or, or, because if we have to go over 15, 30, 45 seconds, that adds up and then we don't get to all the questions. But I know there's a lot of passion out there, so let's go over slightly, but I don't want to get that. Um, so the first question, uh, same, same two minutes, 
for um, each candidate is, so we know that there's, you know, there are educational disparities that exist um, in C3. Uh, so what are the, some of the federal actions you would take to, to fix this problem, especially considering kind of the toxic environment that we exist in? Um, and, you know, if you get elected into the position, you're not necessarily walking into a Congress that is, you know, mostly the majority Democrat. So we'll go ahead and um, we'll start with you, Brian. Or who okay. The... Um, cool, should we stand up? I don't know how we do this. Um, so, uh, we're talking about disparities in education. When we look at, it feels like it's really echoing. Is that the sound system or is that me screaming? <laughs> it's a different mic. Okay, a little of both. <laughs> All right, so um, class size, uh, teacher ratio, resources within the classrooms, those are all economic issues, right? And so um, when we talk about fixing those economics, one of the problems is that educational funding comes from municipal taxes, right? That property taxes pay for schools in large part. So I think we need to clip that, cut it out, go back to what Title I set up and start uh, start using federal money to reinforce some of those local school districts and not, not bring equity to them, but bring the ones on the bottom up, right? Bring the ones on the bottom up. And until we can do that, there's also some other things we can do. If you look at my website, we talk about smarter taxes, we talk about um, mass transit, things you can do to bring wages up in some of those districts that then increase the public funding. Um, and then we can hit Betsy Davos where it hurts, which is in her pocketbook, and we can refuse to fund, we can refuse to fund any of her programs that's sending money to charter schools, right? No more charter school funding. All that money's got to come to the public schools. Our country is only as great as our public schools allow it to be. Our future is kind of dependent on it. And I do want to say while I'm up here, because it doesn't seem like it's an educational thing, but for me it really is that as long as we have a president who is an admitted sexual assaulter, as long as we have a president who is a white supremacist and saying horrible things about refugees, then we're going to have a really hard time communicating to people in our district that they are worth the same as everybody else. If we have a little girl in a classroom who sees a picture of the president on the wall, and that's Donald Trump, and we know what he said about people like her, how do we convince her that she's worth the same as everybody else? How do we convince our Somali children in these classrooms? How do we convince a Somali child that refugees are just like everyone else in this country, and that they're not a danger, and that they're, they're not terrorists? As long as that picture is sitting up there, and that's why the first thing I'll do, I'm getting told to stop, but the first thing I'll do is, is file impeachment papers. When I went to school, I had talented and passionate teachers who heard the call from John F. Kennedy and went into public service. Today, political leaders can raise the esteem and the value of teachers. The federal government needs to be supportive of teachers, especially public teachers, teachers with their words and actions. I had one a client in public education, one of the largest school districts in the US. I took over a failing project there. Failing projects always have bad behavior somewhere around the, the organization. We addressed that some of those bad, the bad behavior, some of those issues, and they succeeded. There are two main areas, for, two main roles for federal government in public education. One is funding. Many school districts are struggling because their communities have been hit hard by globalization and the wealth gap. Here's a good place for the federal government to work on that wealth gap, use some of the good tax policy ideas that Sanders and Clintons had in, in 2016, and fund the gap that is not the, the fault of those struggling school districts. The second thing to do, many districts suffer struggles and issues that others have solved. The federal government can be a facilitator. Collect those stories, how they did it, the lessons learned, and find struggling districts that have those same issues, give them those success stories, the how-tos, so that they can adapt and implement what's already working. So I tell you one thing that we're not going to do. We're not going to give a single dime of public education dollars to charter schools or for for-profit charter schools or vouchers. 
The last thing that we need to do is start chipping away at a good public edu education system. Now, my wife and I, one of the things that we value most about the community in which we live in is the strength of the school system. We stand behind teachers because teacher, teachers are the bedrock of this community. Now, one place that we can, actually, I want to add real quickly too, that my, my teachers, they come in and they, they work early, they stay late, and in some cases, they provide their own resources to help enrich the educational experience for students. I know this because my sister is a public school teacher, she teaches high school. My mother-in-law was the head of her teacher's union. We need to do everything we can to empower them. And when we talk about empowerment and what the congressional government can do, we need to empower our communities. Strong communities provide for strong school systems. Now, what do I mean by this? We need to talk about the economy. We need to talk about jobs. And at a very minimum, we have to fund free and reduced school lunches that have been cut by Paulson and the Republicans. That's low hanging fruit that is easy to correct and we knew it to do it today. My wife, she's a pediatrician, we talk about this stuff a lot and children need to be in a position where they can learn. And the only way that they can effectively do that is to have food in their bellies. Thank you. Uh, the, the great promise of America is equal opportunity. And we have done far too many children in this country a disservice by not providing the high quality education that they deserve uh, and should be demanded. Uh, it's a dereliction of duty, a collective duty, uh, and has to change. I'm particularly embarrassed that in our own state of Minnesota, uh, that the gradu graduation rate uh, of students of color is about 18%, I think below that of, uh, of Caucasian students. Uh, uh, that is not reasonable, it has to change. How do we do so? What's the prescription? Uh, through my work in philanthropy and education, uh, most research uh, seems to indicate that it's not about how beautiful a school is, how modern, how wonderful the facilities. It is the quality of the leadership of the school, the principal, and the teachers. So we need to attract the very best and brightest to be principals and the very best and brightest to be teachers. It is the most honorable, important profession in this country. And we need to attract the very best and brightest to the most disadvantaged, challenging circumstances. That is one. Uh, we also need to invest in early childhood education. It is not fair to send children to wonderful teachers who are not prepared to learn. We need to invest in that. We need to do it now. We need to, three, invest in philanthropic endeavors like NAS, Northside Achievement Zone, that provide support services on a very unique basis to families and students in disadvantaged circumstances. We need to support them, uh, and investing in those things will make all the difference in the world. I also, four, I think there's a grand opportunity in this country with retirees who have time on their hands uh, and great experience, life experience and otherwise, uh, to develop a national core of retirees that would go into public schools and help support teachers, provide hugs to kids, reading to kids, and support. Uh, we can do it, we need some action, we need some leadership, uh, and I can't wait to see the day when we start. So every issue that comes before Congress requires a holistic approach to solve the problem but perhaps none more than educational disparities. And regardless of whether or not we have a majority in the House in 2018, or if we are still living in the political climate that we have now, we must elect officials who will create spaces to have these holistic conversations to ensure that all of the problems are being addressed. So when we're talking about educational disparities, we have to acknowledge that academic success is directly correlated with socioeconomic status. Children from low-income neighborhoods often suffer from lower grades, decreased graduation rates, um, increased rates of drug use, and mental health. And despite when we have put money into the education system, it does not correlate with academic achievement. And that's because that education requires health and well-being for children and families. And this is not being addressed. For example, one in five children in Minnesota have a diagnosable mental health condition. That is the similar across the nation as well. And mental health, if left untreated, um, can cause a host of other issues. 
Untreated mental health disproportionately impacts ethnic minorities. Of those that need services, people that identify as non-white, only one in 10 receive those services, compared to one in three of people that identify as white. Un leaving these untreated will associate um, diminished academic success. Nearly 50% of people with unmet needs drop out of high school. Children need a dynamic support system and access to basic community resources in order to thrive in the environment. Thank you, everybody, for um, kind of that kickoff question. Um, also, this this will be a pretty brief question. Um, so, do you agree to abide by the uh, the FMO endorsement? You can go ahead and start with you. <laughs> That's an easy one for me. Yes, I absolutely will. It's critical that we come out as a united front um, and spend the summer and fall of 2018 working together. If we are fighting against each other until August in the primaries, we will not win in November, period. Yes. <laughs> and, and I want to salute uh, my fellow candidates at the table. Uh, we collectively make this process work. This is, this is democracy at play. It is beautiful. The fact that all of you are here tonight makes us all better. We have a collective objective to unseat Eric Paulson. That is and, and with that said, uh, whether it is me, and I sure hope it is, and I intend to earn that, uh, whether it is anybody next to me uh, who I will support if they become uh, the person that takes on Eric Paulson, we will do this collectively, but it will take the village, uh, and I can't wait to see it happen. Yes. Yes, and I will work very hard on the candidates' campaign. Yes. Okay. Okay. Can everybody hear me now? So I think that's about the shortest answer you're going to get from politicians, so cherish it. Um, next question is, um, let's see, what do you think can be done on a federal level to address the problem of uh, one, so it's kind of a uh, two, two part question. What do you think can be done on a federal level to address the problem of police brutality? Uh, and then also, are you concerned about the militar militarization of our police forces? I know that um, uh, Jeff Sessions, I know there's some, some, some pushback on it, but Jeff Sessions announced that they're going to allow um, you know, the military to give police forces uh, some, some of the military equipment they don't use anymore. So that's kind of where that question came from. So uh, I guess we'll go ahead and start with, um, we'll let's start with Brian. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say that um, I like cops. I used to live with a couple. Um, but the most important thing I think that we can all agree is uh, we just lost a pretty good one here in CD3 and what's up. Um, and Officer Matthews. That whole situation really proved and brought to light how dangerous their job can be at times in ways that we don't always even anticipate, right? Um, and with that being said, it's a really hard job and that's why we can't let bad people do it. Uh, so from the federal level, to answer that question, one of the things we need to do is we need to hold it to the Justice Department and make sure that they're putting pressure on the unions and they're putting pressure on the local police departments to really hold them accountable when things go wrong in their departments. It's one thing, we hear this bad apple thing a lot. It's one thing to say there's a bad apple that spoils the bunch, except there's a lot of people sometimes that cover for that bad apple, right? And so we need to start making sure that those people are held to account. Um, another thing I wanna say is we need to confront the issues and speak to the issues and say them loud and proud so everyone knows where we stand on them, that black lives matter, black lives matter, black lives matter. And and it's okay if, if if, you, if you're uncomfortable, you need to say two at the end of it, you need to say also at the end of it, Black Lives Matter too, Black Lives Matter also, whatever, it all means the same thing. But there are disenfranchised citizens that need to hear that they're being cared about, that their lives matter. Um, and if we're, if we're not doing that, we really can't expect to have a good relationship 
anywhere. Another thing I'd like to see done with the police departments is on the federal level, we can incentivize police officers to be living in the districts and the communities that they actually serve. And we can do that with tax rebates, we can do that with bonus programs. Because um, if, if there's a people that don't trust their police, and there's a police that don't trust their people, the way we get rid of that us versus them mentality is we make them neighbors, right? Then we all have the same interests. We all want to keep these streets safe because this is our home, right? Protect and serve each other, this community. Uh, and that's that's one of the things I'd like to see done. Those are some of the things I'd like to see done. First, the vast majority of police throughout the U.S. are very good at what they do. The main thing the federal government can do is collect and share data. Many police departments are implementing training now to, to re, uh, respond to this, to get ahead of the issues that are going on with police brutality. What the federal government can do is facilitate that training by helping to identify those programs that are working well, share those with other departments so that they can adapt them and implement them for what works for them. Another thing, the federal government can do is track officer-involved shooting so that we can gather the data, we can analyze that, and use that to help uh, curb the police uh, unique events, those rare cases when there's that shooting of an innocent person. Regarding militarization, President Obama had a policy that prevented police departments from buying military equipment. Trump overturned that. There's no reason police need a 50 caliber rifle or armed attack vehicles. It sends the message to communities that the police serve that they're at war with them. I think I'm going to echo many of these same sentiments. Um, you know, I, I do think about Officer Matthews, uh, who we recently lost in, uh, in duty and service to his city. And everything that I've heard about Officer Matthews, he truly is everything that we want to be looking for in a police officer. He, he actually is the epitome of a peace officer. He is a person who worked with his community, stopped by the true value. There was a dialogue there. Now we've already talked about it, but the Trump administration rolled back the policies of the Obama administration and essentially has put local police departments in a position where if they have the funds and resources, they can buy things like tanks, grenade launchers, bayonets. Now, I trained with bayonets when I was in Fort Benning down in Georgia, and the police department has absolutely no reason to use a bayonet whatsoever. The only thing that I can think of for actually attempting to set a policy play like this in place is to instill fear. And you think about the individuals that were in Charlottesville holding tiki torches. We're playing, Trump is playing to the basest of our, of our society and he's inflaming fear and that's